growth under uh, high and low concentration of uh, nutrients. So the next speaker is Justus Fink. Uh, okay, maybe I need to bring it closer. Getting very close here, but uh, everything for the science. And now, hmm, okay. Does this have a, a laser? Touch the touch the screen. No, no, the screen of the computer. Okay, uh, no pointer. Um, <laughs> Use a pointer and a PowerPoint. Um, okay. I think you have to activate it on the... I think I need to enable this. Yeah. <laughs> I shall... Ah, okay. this ah wow okay thank you Martina uh, this is sponsored by her the, the equipment uh, I will list you in acknowledgments um, okay my name is Justus I, I just finished my PhD in the group of uh, Michael Manhart at ETH Zurich uh, the group has now moved on to uh, Rutgers uh, University um, Michael is also recruiting, so if anything uh, that you see here is interesting to you and you're considering a postdoc uh, in theory, um, then, uh, yeah, please consider the lab. Um, I'm uh, developing basically theory for the evolution of microbial growth traits. Uh, typical questions uh, that I'm interested in is what traits should we expect from evolution and how fast uh, do they evolve? The approach here is to understand selection pressures really well and really sort of in depth uh, using ecological models and then combine this with models from population genetics to come up with an evolutionary trend. And the work that I'm going to present here um, came out at the beginning of the year uh, together with our co-author Noel, uh, who is a postdoc in Zurich with Martin Ackermann. Uh, and together we looked at the evolution uh, of growth at low concentration of nutrients. And the background here is that uh, uh, microbes play a really important function in the environment. One way to see this, if you see these uh, diagrams of nutrient cycles, here different boxes indicate different forms that carbon is stored in, say, uh, the, the ocean or land environment. And you see these arrows, and these are basically uh, the, the fluxes, I think, in, in, in a year in the units of gigatons. And microbes play a role in bringing down CO2 into the ocean and also then uh, releasing CO2 again when they eat, say, the marine snow. Um, and if you want to calculate any of these fluxes, you need to know about the population growth rate of these populations. And uh, growth is a complicated process inside the cell with many inputs. There is sometimes a special scenario where we know that the entire process is limited by a single nutrient. Uh, this is explicitly what you construct in a lab experiment with M9, where you supply all the other essential nutrients, say phosphate and uh, nitrogen at high concentrations, and then you know that usually glucose is the limiting nutrient. And uh, this is a nice setting because it uh, sort of allows to describe the entire growth as a function of this one concentration. And if you look for a function to describe this, you end up uh, with a mono model that was uh, mentioned a lot in the, in the talks before. It's, it's, I think, maybe the first law of um, quantitative microbiology. And this is the curve that Monod described in 1942 um, in his PhD thesis. And uh, he used a relationship that was known from enzyme kinetics. It has two parameters, a maximum growth rate, that's the floor or the ceiling here, and then this parameter K, which I call the half saturation concentration. And it's sort of drawn in this uh, line here. 
the K has different uh, um, words. Sometimes people call it the, also the nutrient affinity or the mono constant. Uh, what's interesting about it, it's basically a, the intrinsic scale of resource concentration for the organisms. So this is a trait, and it sort of encodes what um, uh, concentration the organism needs to reach half its maximum growth rate. When we think about the evolution of this trait, it's relatively clear that lower would be better. And in, in this model, you can see if you lower the K, you basically shift this curve a bit to the left, and then uh, you get higher growth, especially at low concentrations. So the intuition is clear. Um, but it, uh, it's, there's an opportunity to be more quantitative. And we did basically two things. Um, we looked at an empirical distribution of these growth traits in a trait database. We saw that there are systematic differences between species, and that could be explained perhaps by evolution. We also didn't see a trade-off between the K and the Gmax, or no evidence for it. And then in the second part, sort of used an evolutionary model to ask, uh, how should the K evolve? Now, actually, in numbers, how much lower should it be? And it depends on the environment that you're involved in. Yes? So what kind of, uh, when you say trait database uh, for uh, Gmax and for K, mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, somebody mentioned that this, this, this K is all over the place, right? How, how? Um, but what, what, what empirical database do you use? Yes, so it's a database we collected. Huh? It's a database we collected from literature data. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, but, but uh, uh, can you make sense of it? I mean, this case is extremely difficult to measure. I think, I think we can make sense of it. Um, I think um, maybe you let me explain a bit uh, what we see, and then um, the goal is also to sort of uh, resurrect the K measurements that it's not all um, noise, but there's actually some sort of signal in it. Um, and this is, uh, the starting point of this is the collection of these uh, trade measurements, and it, this is uh, the work of Noel. She went out and looked for papers that basically took a species and uh, uh, just decided uh, on a limiting nutrient, and then measured this response and reported the K and the Gmax. Uh, there were other, um, um, summaries of these data that we used. Um, one is uh, from, the, from the 90s and the 80s. These two mostly focus on systems biology organisms, and then there's a lot of trade data from uh, phytoplankton. And the kind of table that we end up with is we have some information on the species on, and their strain labels, the two traits, Gmax and K, and then we have sort of all these meta variables like temperature and experiment type. Just to give you sort of uh, a look, uh, at the historic trend, this is the number of measurements that were reported in each year. This is the original measurement of Mono, and then you can clearly see there's a trend. 80s was probably the early 80s was probably the best time to uh, <laughs> measure these these cases, and then people measured less and less. And uh, two important things to say here that uh, we took care to only include data from growth rate. There are other um, limiting concentrations that are reported, but they're sometimes based on measurements of respiration or measurements of uptake. Um, when you check um, um, for, um, uh, in a subset of the data from this phytoplankton database, you can see that while there is sort of a similar functional form for uptake, um, actually the, the, the half saturation concentrations are not the same. We um, exclusively uh, focus on the growth traits. And um, we also have a lot of diversity of measurements in this data set. So there's, uh, say, at least three ways to measure this. Um, you can use a chemostat. And in the chemostat, the parameter that you tune is the dilution rate, and the parameter that you measure is the concentration at steady state. So if you set a range of constant, uh, dilution rates, uh, you get this response curve. Uh, you can also do this um, in a series of batch cultures where you tune the initial concentration and you always try to measure the growth rate at steady state. And then a third way is to do actually only one batch culture growth cycle and measure a time series. And if you can sort of resolve the time points up here, there's some information on the K in this deceleration. If you actually look into Monod's thesis, he used this large, last approach. Um, there's some um, fundamentally different biology going on. So this is a steady state across environments. 
this is sort of a trajectory where there's some sort of history dependence. Um, both of them gave rise to the same response. Um, I think this is something that um, at this point we only sort of accept, uh, but I think it would be maybe interesting from, to hear from phys physiology people. Um, All right, uh, the number three is especially, even though it was a Monod original, is especially a suspect here because if you are just about to finish the exponential growth, you are transitioning to the growth, uh, you, you may actually have, your Gmax may change systematically because you start pre-allocating maybe resources for the next environment or for stationary phase. And since all you can measure is the ratio between Gmax and K, you, you kind of rely on Gmax staying the same throughout the entire, uh, entire growth curve. Does, does it make sense? Um, I'm, so I, I didn't get it right now, but maybe we can. Well, yeah, we, we, can, we can talk about it. I think the question I want to ask is connected to this. So you were saying that option number two and number three give the same response. Do you mean that the values of Gmax and K that you get from these two type of experiments are the same? Something that we sort of explicitly checked. Um, but I, I think, I mean, I didn't perform these measurements. Um, I just wanted, I think it's interesting that um, the mono model has been around for a long time. Um, there were always competing models that people proposed, like the Droop model and, and also a Holling type response. But it sort of survived, right? This is a model that survived 70 years, and it was always sort of good enough for what the people trying to do. And then apparently, in both of these situations, it fitted the data um, to the best that the original authors sort of uh, could decide. I'm uh, going to move on uh, to what the, the data actually shows. Um, so this is our data set. We have here uh, a number of, of resources. Um, from left to right, most visual measurements are actually in uh, phosphate and, uh, and as a sort of a nutrient that is much studied in marine organisms. And then we have glucose as sort of a uh, nutrient of systems biology. You can sort of see it in the colors. So um, green are prokaryotes, um, orange are eukaryotes, pa possibly cells that are a bit larger. Um, and then we have different um, shapes for organisms that are, say, autotrophs because they fix, as, phyto, uh, as phytoplankton, they fix energy um, from the light, and classical heterotrophs like E. coli. And um, one thing to see here is that it, it goes uh, 10 orders of magnitude, uh, if you consider all resources. Um, for comparison, so this dot here, it's at roughly 10 millimolar, this is the concentration you would use in a uh, classical M9 medium with glucose. So that's your 0 0.2% uh, glucose. And um, say the concentration that the LTE uses is about two orders of magnitude lower, but it's still relatively high compared to these uh, half saturation concentrations for E. coli. Um, we see systematic differences, sort of, especially between phosphorus and the rest. Um, we don't really have a good idea why. Um, if you look um, at these dashed lines, this is another sort of sanity check. This is a concentration where a cell with this volume, one micrometer uh, squared, um, one micrometer cubic, um, would have one molecule per cell. So this is, say, roughly the vo volume of an E. coli cell. And, um, uh, at this concentration, if E. coli had a half saturation this low, it would be basically be able to grow at maximum rate with one molecule per cell. Low, most of our data points of E. coli are actually up here in this glucose bar, so it's, it's a bit removed, so probably it's, it's more like uh, 100 molecules per cell. And then, of course, you have larger organisms, um, sort of this line goes down. Um, but it's sort of good, good to see that most of these points are above the line. There's two exceptions, um, which are vitamins, thiamine and vitamin B12. Um, unfortunately, we only, these are single uh, measurements. We don't know about the variation in these, uh, but um, it would be highly interesting if somebody reports more vitamin measurements in the future. 
Uh, sorry, do you have uh, some data for the same organism, same conditions, that we can see how many orders of magnitude are between different data sets? Or? Um, I mean, I'm going to zoom in now on glucose. Um, you mean? Uh, okay, so, so, but these are then at the same temperature, or is there just like? Yeah, we're, we're going to talk about temperature and experiment type, yes. So okay. I'm getting there. Uh, you, you, you mentioned that you don't understand why phosphorus is the lowest, uh, but for instance, uh, uh, there should be some uh, correlation of this K with uh, stoichiometry of the nutrient. And famously, there is a Redfield law, which is approximate stoichiometry of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus among marine organisms, which tells you that, for instance, nitrogen should be six times more uh, abundant inside the biomass, and carbon is another 100 times more abundant than phosphorus. So I would, if I just squint at your data, I will see that the carbon, at least the glucose, is uh, largest, the nitrogen somewhere in the middle, and the phosphorus is somewhere at the lower end. So that, that, that may be the explanation for your uh, trend between elements. Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is ex exactly sort of uh, the type of thinking um, that, uh, yeah, it would be very interesting. Um, maybe we can build a model for it that connects these two things. Um, so if you zoom in on glucose, um, you can resolve the variation by species, and you see, um, I'm going to single out two species, E. coli and yeast, and um, you can see um, each of them has large variation, but there's still systematic differences between them. There's uh, next to no overlap between these two distributions, and systematic differences between species is also something that we see on other resources. Um, if we focus on E. coli, we can now ask, okay, where does all this variation come from? And we have these meta variables that we recorded in our database. And what I did, I took um, this as the, the predicting variable and I asked how much of it can be explained if I correlated with maximum growth rate, with temperature, with the experiment type, with sort of the strain labels that we have, and then with the author. Um, so the author is a bit uh, tricky. I think the author is a combination of all of these two things. So you have little publications that actually measure the same strains that other authors did. Um, so every author basically um, uh, came up with uh, uh, um, a unique sp spot or a unique patch in this landscape of possible conditions, but they rarely sort of measure the same conditions that somebody else did. Um, let's go. Well, the most, I'm going, the method is this experiment type. Um, that's where we record basically batch, chemostat, batch with time series, um, and these things. Um, this is the next slide. On this slide, um, we had uh, strain labels, and most of the strain labels were unique, so there was only one measurement, but there was two strain labels that were, were the multiple measurements. One is ML30, this is the original strain that Monod measured. And you can see it's different groups that measured it. And uh, they got um, variation that was much less uh, than what we see in the entire data set. ML3008 is a mutant of ML30. Um, and here uh, we see now um, the same strain with two very different values. Um, if you look at the experiment type now, um, so these experiments were either done in uh, uh, batch culture or the, uh, the chemostat. And um, these are all chemostat measurements. Here's the difference between chemostat and batch. So this is actually a paper, I think, that tried to explicitly test this. And I think it gives us sort of an estimate, like you can take this, basically it could be off by 1.5 orders of magnitude or say two orders of magnitude, depending on chemostat or batch. If you go to temperature, temperature does not have a big effect. So these were actually measured at different temperatures. Um, and then uh, maximum growth rate is actually uncorrelated in this data set. Um, so these are all the E. coli measurements where we had maximum growth rate. And you, the trade-off here would be a positive co uh, correlation. But if you calculate the, uh, the rank correlation, there's uh, uh, no significant correlation at all. Um, 
this interesting, this was interesting to us that there was no max correlation with maximum growth rate here. So we checked um, more closely. We also see no correlation in the yeast. And um, then we checked on different nutrients. And there's also, the result is always the same. When you calculate the rank correlation coefficient, it's not significantly different from zero. Okay, so what leaves us out with, there's a large variation within species and we, we see from like looking at individual examples that maybe one or two orders of magnitude could be explained uh, by the experiments if we're uh, conservative. Um, but there's still systematic differences between species that are larger. And this is not explained by selection on maximum growth rate. So your maximum growth rate does not explain your K. So this was interesting now because we, uh, um, uh, uh, we thought, okay, maybe there's a history here that these strains, say uh, yeast and E. coli, have evolved in different environments in the past and that is sort of reflected in, in the mean half saturation concentration. This is um, a classic uh, theme in uh, evolution that features of the environment imprint sort of on the organism. This is two uh, birds from Darwin's finches. Darwin's finches were studied, um, um, I think first by Darwin himself, who, who saw that they have different beak sizes, and then later in the 1950s by um, a couple of evolutionary biologists, and I think up to this day by Peter and Rosemary Grant. And the idea, um, one of the observations here is that the beak size reflects the, the size of the seeds that they're eating. And something like this could be here in this microbes um, that uh, E. coli, um, its original habitat is, is the gut, or um, say the wastewater. These are low glucose environments, but yeast um, is used a lot on fruits on, in, in baking conditions. That's a lot of sugar, so maybe that's reflected in the cave. This is a hypothesis, and we used basically um, modeling to test it. Um, this is the outcome of the modeling. Um, so we, we did, uh, we modeled evolution in the chemostat, and we see that evolution is pretty relentless. So if you give it, if you keep giving it mutations, uh, the chemostat will drive the K lower and lower, and only when you run out of mutations uh, will the evolution actually come to a stop. So the chemostats environments, they're really aggressive, and they basically would drive this K um, to the boundary of what's physiologically possible um, until you sort of hit suddenly a uh, constraint that lowering the K would change other traits. Now, in the batch culture environment, this is an environment that's like the long-term evolution experiments where you have these growth cycles. Actually, even if you give it um, a lot of mutations all the time, evolution sort of stabilizes by itself. And um, that was sort of, uh, from the uh, evolutionary perspective, the most interesting uh, mechanism. So we focused on that. Uh, quickly, sort of the simulation is simplified in the, um, Basically, we have some, some growth cycles going up and down in the background, and then we sample um, mutations, and then these mutations can expand and replace the previous type. New mutations appear. Sometimes they also fail to fix, and the way we calculate this is that for every mutant that appears, we calculate a selection coefficient and then a fixation probability, and then basically with a certain probability, you reject or accept that mutation. And this, um, uh, something that uh, I wanted to just to highlight as a teaser. So calculating these selection coefficients was a, a key technical step. And uh, we break it down to a basic unit, one growth cycle. Say this is somewhere in the middle of the competition where they're 50-50. For each growth cycle, we can calculate the selective advantage from the beginning to the end. The number that we calculate here is this S. It's the selection coefficient. It only depends sort of on frequencies at the end and the frequencies at the beginning. Uh, we were, um, we did not care sort of what happened inside the growth cycle. Uh, and and uh, so we um, decided to um, not simulate it, but instead calculate the S and just uh, given the traits and the initial frequency, we can directly predict the, the final frequency uh, uh, using uh, an explicit formula. And on the tutorial on Tuesday, I, I will talk about a bit more about this because this is an explicit representation of selection pressure. And sort of understanding how this object changes with concentration can tell you how, in which conditions, say, a mutant on G max is selected more than a mutant is selected on K. Okay. 
Okay, uh, there was a key assumption in our model. That's basically how we uh, sample the mutation. So um, we draw a random mutation effect, um, and that is from a uniform distribution that has a maximum value kappa. And what we assume is that this uh, effect does not change. So here you can get plus minus kappa, and here you can still get plus minus kappa. Um, this is uh, not realistic, so you would expect that as the trait changes, also the range uh, that mutations, uh, the effect that mutations can have would maybe shrink, so kappa would get smaller. However, it's, uh, what we're interested in is basically more a maximum possible evolution, so if you give the process always new mutations that have this fixed relative effect, um, what is the maximum possible evolution that you can get from selection? And what you see here is uh, a trajectory. This is a population that starts at a certain ratio uh, k to r0. This is highly unadapted. Uh, uh, the, the k is much higher than the environmental concentration used in this batch culture. It quickly goes down and then stabilizes. You can see there's some stochasticity here. This is because of the, the sampling and uh, the, the stochastic probability of fixation that we use. Um, the, one thing to say about the time scale, um, so this is, this is 50 times uh, the population size. So at, at this point, we, um, uh, over this time scale, you also see sort of the fixation of some, some uh, neutral mutations at the end. There is uh, a threshold here that uh, forms a plateau. We can calculate it. Um, but I first wanted to uh, give you sort of the intuition what happens here in the growth cycle. So we start in a situation that is highly unadapted where we have a clear exponential phase and then this deceleration at the end. And if you measure your D, you would see it in this uh, curved shape here. And if we, in this situation, calculate what would 1% on the growth rate and 1% on the K, a 1% improvement in each of these traits, how much fitness would that give you? We can break it down by these two traits and this is the total fitness that a 1% mutant in each of these traits has. And you can see that this much comes from growth rate and this much comes from the K. And in this case, we can see sort of the K is actually more strongly selected because the 1% in the K gives you a larger uh, contribution to the relative fitness. However, at evolved stage, um, now you're current K is already much lower than the resource concentration, which you mean you have this very sharp arrest at the end. The growth is now very much like a, in a, a kink. Um, you've basically evolved the deceleration of A, and all the selection that is left is now on the maximum growth rate. And this is the, the mechanism um, by which we get this plateau, that you basically, in the, in the beginning, have a lot of selection on the K, but this pressure sort of, as you adapt, um, you, this phase gets shorter and shorter, you expose the trade less and less during the competition and you have less selection pressure. Uh, we get um, a scaling relationship um, that says that the evolved trade depends on the con concentration that you would use for your evolution and the population size at the bottleneck. Um, there's one last feature um, that's interesting here um, that's asking, are these two parameters independent? Yeah. You said that the selection coefficient was also related to Gmax, but... Um... Yeah, so for the evolution, we... Um, um, so we've seen in the, in the trade distribution, right, that these traits are largely um, um, uh, uncorrelated. Um, so we could assume that they evolve independently. Uh, and to make things... Um, you can assume an independent um, mutation effect on the two traits. And to make things even simpler, we just uh, assumed a mutation effect on the K. So the K, the Gmax in this background is not evolving, no. And in your experiment, do you also allow cell to die uh, between uh, one uh, spike and the other? So you just study the growth and the stationary phase? So we have death in form of this dilution, but not within the growth cycle. 
Um, okay, so we get this, this uh, scaling relationship, um, and this is basically what the hypothesis said, right? You have your environmental concentration, and your wolf trade is proportional to that. However, there's also this additional factor, the population size at the bottleneck, um, that uh, sort of interferes with it. And in the evolutionary terms, this is a balance between uh, selection and drift at the bottom. Um, and uh, there's one um, very subtle detail um, that these two parameters could um, actually not be independent depending on how you run your evolution experiment. So this is um, uh, one way to transfer between growth cycles is... Uh, I yeah. have another question. So can you get the prefactor between K, Evo, R0, yeah. and E, because then you can test it with values. There are values from effective population size of different. Yeah, yeah, we have the, we have the prefactor. There's a prefactor that also depends on the maximum mutation effect you can have. And then there's a logarithmic term. Um, so the problem is we have uh, underdetermined this. So we actually don't know the concentration that uh, E. coli would experience in the gut, and we don't know if it's a chemostat or a batch culture. Um, for the, well, we know this really well is the LTE. And in the LTE, what you see is that the concentration they used was um, too high to create a selection pressure on the K. Um, so to, to um, basically uh, cut this short, these two things, depending on how you transfer, they can be correlated. And this is one way to transfer is to reset to a fixed biomass. So if you've done your first growth cycle one day, and you reset to the same OD. Now, if you would use a larger resource concentration, you would still reset to the same OD. In this case, the bottleneck size and the resource concentration are independent. And you can really get this scaling relationship. However, most of the experiments work this way, where you reset with a fixed dilution factor. So growth cycle with more resources, like the right one here, also gives you a higher population size, and you get this positive correlation between the two things. And if you put in the math and you look at the, uh, the factors in the formula, you can see that this actually cancels out. Um, what we then reconstructed is um, basically an inverse problem. This is the a distribution of case that we've seen in the E. coli data, and we asked with what sort of uh, glucose concentration would they be compatible with. And here we assume uh, basically that we can estimate a mutation effect from the LTE. It's not a direct test, but we, um, for this you would really have to measure spontaneous mutations. Um, but we basically assume that the thing that we have observed in the LTE is uh, at the evolutionary steady state. So this is the 140 micromolar that they're using here. And now, if you would um, uh, uh, take uh, an E. coli in your data set and ask which resource concentration did it evolve on, um, it depends what kind of environment you assume. If it's a fixed bottleneck biomass, you can say, well, these E. coli, they came from a higher concentration environment. Um, but if it's a uh, fixed dilution factor, you can see that this E. coli here is compatible actually with a lot of resource concentrations. So in this sense, it's not uh, a biomarker for the environment. So even if you know the wolf trait, it's compatible with a lot of historic concentrations. Okay, this is, um, uh, uh, I would say, the evolutionary um, high point. I think especially interested uh, maybe in this context to discuss uh, more about the trade-offs and if you have any questions, um, yes, I'm happy to, happy to take them. <laughs>